Um, I think we're picking up around page 80 with a passage we briefly discussed at the very end. Um, Tuesday. When Harry says to Lupin, you think I'm a fool? Lupin, no, I think you're like James. Who would have regarded it as a height of dishonor to mistrust his friends? And here he immediately thinks Peter Pettigrew. So they talk about burying Mad Eye's body. And I, I mentioned before, I don't remember if I mentioned this in class or after I left to somebody. Um, we're going to see another part of Mad Eye get buried later on, which we'll talk about when we get to it. So, about a page further on, they're talking about. Harry, because he essentially says, I've got to leave. You're all in danger if I stick around. Okay? And Hagrid says, you're not going anywhere. After all we went through to get you here, George, yeah, what about my ear? I know. Matt, I wouldn't want. I know. Yeah, Matt, I's dead. So, you know. Harry felt beleaguered. Text. He felt beleaguered and blackmailed. Did they think he did not know what they had done for him? Didn't they understand that it was for precisely that reason he wanted to go now before they had to suffer any more on his behalf? Go back for a moment to something Dumbledore says in the book five when he's explaining to Harry about the prophecy, okay? He mentions the flaw in his plan. Now, he doesn't explain the whole plan, right? Harry doesn't get the whole plan until towards the end of this book. Um, he mentions the flaw in his plan. The flaw was he cared too much, okay? But what else? He says, what did I care for nameless, faceless people in the future who might die in the future? And here's Harry, <coughs> nameless, faceless people, Matt, right? Mm -hmm. Hedwig, okay? Here's Harry, and he's thinking about, I don't want anybody else dying for me. I don't want anybody else suffering for me, okay? Later on, we're going to see Harry be challenged much later on. We're going to see Harry be challenged. If you don't surrender yourself now, I'll kill them all. Okay? What's he want to do? Kind of here. Well, he wants to leave, but he wants to find the Horcruxes and all that kind of stuff so he can defeat Voldemort. Didn't they understand it was precisely for that reason he wanted to go now, before any more had to suffer, before they had to suffer any more on his behalf? Mrs. Weasley, where's Hedwig, Harry? We can put her up with Pig Widgeon and give her something to eat. We could not tell her the truth. Wait till it gets out and you did it again, Harry, says Hagrid. You fought him off again. Harry, it wasn't me. It was my wand. My wand acted of its own accord. Notice, after a few moments, Hermione says gently, But that's impossible, Harry. <laughs> Why? Wands don't act on their own. Wands don't have minds. You mean, notice, all throughout the novels, somebody says something, usually where we see this the most, somebody says something and the Harry interprets it. But we see that a few other times, okay? Hermione heard what Harry said, <coughs> and notice, she says, you mean, what does she mean by saying you mean? You're wrong, Harry. <laughs> this is what really happened. Harry doesn't say that when Dumbledore says, 
the night you received that scar, Voldemort transferred some of his powers in. Harry doesn't say, no, you're wrong, Mr. Dumbledore. What really happened was, you did magic without meaning to. You reacted instinctively. No. And listen to what he says, and then turn to, hopefully I've got the page number in our book, or in your book. No, said Harry. The bike was falling. I couldn't have tell you where Voldemort was, but my wand spun in my hand and found him and shot a spell at him. And it wasn't even a spell I recognized. I've never made gold flames appear before. All right? So he says... His wand spun in his hand. I like to tell people when I teach in, you know, writing courses or, or when I've required papers in this class before. Little things like prepositions and adverbs are really, really important. They carry much meaning in modern English. The wand spun in his hand, like the needle on a compass. Take a magnet, find a compass, take a magnet, and wave the magnet over the compass, and the needle will spin. Okay. Notice he doesn't say, the wand spun my hand. Like, he doesn't say, the wand moved my hand. It spun in his hand. All right? Hopefully I have this marked. Turn to page. First, chap first page of chapter 18. The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore. Which I hope I'm not giving away too much. The very end of the second paragraph. If you've not read this far, if you've not, you know, read the Harry Potter things before and you haven't gotten this far, don't read anything before that. <laughs> she had not felt, she, Hermione, had not felt the wand spin like the needle of a compass and shoot golden flames at his enemy. Okay? That's what's being talked about there. I think that's the page I wanted to be at. So, also, go back and look at page, probably, 63, 62, it's probably around 61 or 62. Should be the last page of chapter four. As the pain from Harry's scar forced his eyes shut, his wand acted of its own accord. Notice, this is the narrator telling us this. Now, the narrator isn't always Harry's perspective. Okay? He felt it drag his hand. Okay? Harry feels the wand do this. Round like some great magnet, saw a spurt of golden fire through his half-closed eyes, heard a crack and a scream of fury. What's the crack? It's the other wand. It's the wand that Voldemort's using, breaking. Okay. The remaining Death Eater yelled. Voldemort screamed, no! Why? No! My wand! The brother wand to Harry's. Okay, so he felt it spin his hand. Here, my wand spun in my hand. That later chapter, at the beginning of the lies and life of Albus Dumbledore, it spun like the needle of a compass in his hand. There's a problem, right? We've got Two different descriptions of the same event. Which one's correct? 
just this is an example of you got to get those damn details. You got to be careful with them. Okay? But here he says, no. The no isn't about, you know, does it really matter whether the wand spins in his hand or the wand spins his hand? Ultimately, no. What matters is, Harry says, I had nothing to do with it. Mr. Weasley, often, notice taking on this kind of professorial tone, often when you're in a pressured situation, you can produce magic you never dreamed of. Small children often find before they're trained, it wasn't like that. Shut the up. Harry's just, no. Notice, why did I say, you know, add the shut the up? Harry said through gritted teeth. He's pissed. Quit telling me what happened when I was there. His scar was burning. He felt angry and frustrated. He hated the idea. They're all imagining him to have power to match Voldemort's. What did Dumbledore explain in the chapter, in the previous book, about the prophecy? Not book five, the previous book. The one where Harry finally came to understand what death was going to be like. One of two things, right? Marching in, head held high, or being dragged, kicking, and screaming. Dumbledore says, un, I can learn how to write, uncommon skill and power. Okay? The Dark Lord knows not. He knew they did not believe him. And now that he came to think of it, you know, he'd never heard of a wand performing magic on its own. His scar is searing with pain. Why? Two reasons, Dumbledore said, book five. Why his scar hurts? Voldemort's. Because <laughs> Dumbledore's dead. <laughs> he's not mostly dead, he's totally gone, okay? One, when Voldemort is really angry, or he's near, warning bells should be going off, right? So he sets down his glass and he leaves. He goes off to the outside. Dumbledore would have believed him. He knew it. Dumbledore would have known how and why Harry's wand had acted independently. Because Dumbledore always had the answers. He thinks at this point. But Dumbledore, like Mad-Eye, like Sirius, like his parents, like his poor owl, all were gone, where Harry would never talk to them again. Right? Every one of them's dead. This isn't like, you know, my previous class, the one I teach before this, this isn't like in the Abhorsen trilogy by Garth Nix, where people can go into death to speak to the dead, or can go into death to make sure the dead stay dead, to send them all the way into death, okay? You, you don't get any of that. Nor is this Trelawney-ish kind of, because the kind of magic Trelawney uses is in our world, Totally fraudulent, right? So if there's another kind of magic in our world that I would argue, some of you may believe in it, is totally fraudulent, Trelawney would probably practice it. Seances. Ooh, I can speak with... Harry can't speak to any of them. And that isn't going to really hit him until he gets to Godric's Hollow. And it's going to come down like a ton of bricks. Right? And then he hears Voldemort's voice. You told me the problem would be solved by using another wand. No, I didn't. Sorry, you know. So, Lucius's wand is just, it's not 
Voldemort, right? Why? Because back there at Malfoy Manor, he says, Lucius, I require your wand. And Lucius is like, oh, okay. He hands him his and, my wand? You want, my... get the hell out of here, you know. Malfoy now is what? Wandless. Which in the magical world, no weapon. Okay. So, chapter six. The ghoul in pajamas, which we're going to skip most of. Because most of it's not important. Until we get to page 102. Harry goes, Harry and Ron and Hermione go into Ron's room. And Hermione, or Hermione, Hermione, been out since four. Hermione pulls out of her Mary Poppins bag. You know, she just can pull all kinds of stuff out of this, bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. It's her own personal TARDIS that she carries with her. She starts pulling out books. And where'd she get these books from? Secrets of the Darkest Art, for example. She stole them from Dumbledore's office after he died. She figures we're going after Horcruxes. There aren't any Horcrux books in the library. She put two and two together. Dumbledore must have had them. Okay? So they talk about Horcruxes. And we're told, the paragraph that begins, and the more I've read about them, said Hermione, well, I'll just finish the rest, the more horrible they seem. And the less I can believe, he actually made six. It warns in this book how unstable you make the rest of your soul by ripping it. And that's just by making one work crux. Okay? That kind of implies you only rip your soul when you, one, murder somebody, and two, make a horcrux as a result of the murder. But that's not what Dumbledore said, or that's not what Slughorn said in the memory that Harry retrieved. What Slughorn said was, you do the greatest act of evil. You kill someone, and that rips your soul. But then you can do what? You can take that part of your soul and put it in something. And that's when Tom Riddle goes, cool. Well, not really, but. So, you know, just for academic exercise, you know, research, would it be possible to do that more than once? And he's like, dude, what would you want to do that for? He's like, you know, seven is a magical number. What if you rip your soul so that there are seven pieces? Okay. But he said, killing is what rips the soul. Huh. Again, I, there's a, I think at least, a logical inconsistency there. So, Harry remembered what Dumbledore had said. Ron. Interesting that Ron thinks this. Isn't there any way of putting yourself back together again? <laughs> and notice, I put the again. Why? Because I'm thinking Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Ron asks, isn't there any way to put yourself back together? Why would you ask that? What does that imply? That you want to be whole again. And Hermione says, yes. Good question, Ron. You're actually showing some ingenuity on your own part. But it would be, notice the adverb. Excruciatingly painful. What is the root of that word? Croops. Cross. It would be painful as a cross. Right? How do you die on a cross? You don't die from the wound, from the wounds caused by the nails. You die from asphyxiation. You suffocate. 
How do you suffocate? Because, you know, imagine... No, I can use this. Imagine, here's the cross, right? You get nailed on the cross lying flat on the ground. Because it's kind of hard to nail somebody when they're way up here. So you nail the person down like this. And then what you have to do is you have to lift the cross up. But you can't just lift the cross up like that because it's not going to stand up. It's not like they're nailing supports like when, you know, when a builder puts up a wall and supporting it. No, you have it down like this. And it's like putting a fence post in. You dig a hole deep enough for the base of this part to slide into. So you dig that hole and you lift the cross up to it. And at one point, the cross will, the, the upright, will reach a point where it clears both sides. And what happens? It just goes like this and gently falls down? No. It does this, and because of the weight of the person on it, it goes wham! The person's being held by nails either in the wrist or in the palm and through the ankles because the legs are together like this. It is through both legs. When that upright falls, both shoulders are immediately dislocated. Yeah, I know. Go away. So now all the person can do is because they can't get their lungs full of air. That's why it can take a day or two. Plus, you've got the pain. That's why we get the word excruciating, crucio. Okay, it's the cruciatus curse. So. She says, it would be excruciatingly painful. Harry, why? Why? How do you do it? How do you make someone that's broken whole again? Think, not in terms of the how, but think Gandalf and Gollum. Think Frodo and Sarah Man. What does Frodo hope for Sarah Man? that he will find his cure. Okay? That's why he doesn't want him killed. Remorse, says Hermione. You've got to really feel what you've done. So how is that excruciatingly painful? Go ahead. I was going to say, sometimes when people do stuff, they don't really recognize. So it's like reliving back to... Okay. Reliving back to... I was thinking more of like, um, I guess kind of a medical sense where you feel the sensation that you gave the person that you killed. Okay. Because it's never directly explained how they feel these things. And so the remorse is like the guilt that they feel and they're reliving the pain that they caused. Okay. Could be. What's remorse? In a non-magic, I'm just here. What's remorse? What is it to be really contrite? To be really sorry for something you've done? It's admitting, first of all, what? I did something wrong. It's admitting, oh, let's go ahead and use the word that the Sorting Hat uses in its song, in Order of the Phoenix. It, it is admitting my fault in both senses of the word. Fault like my error and fault like my splitting. And we can kind of talk about horcruxes and go back to the song. <laughs> because what is the th what is it that the song fears? The song fear, or the, the hat fears, I have to do what every year? Split the students. It splits the incoming Hogwarts first years. And they're going across the boat. They're just what? They're just first years. 
They're not Slytherins, Ravenclaws, Hufflepuffs, or Gryffindors. And what does the song, what does the hat have to do? It has to look in each one and horcrux them. Not literally. It doesn't take part and put it over here, but it splits them. It makes what is whole, unwhole. You go into this house because you show this preponderance of qualities rather than being put in on the basis of a whole. That's why I think it is so important that the song relates to us what Hufflepuff said. I'll take the lot. I'll take them all. I'll take them whole. Not do any splitting. Even Gryffindor splits. Gryffindor, you know, high and mighty, oh, the most wonderful. He does what? Now I'll take the brave, the daring, those with chivalry to their name. You know, if you, you okay, so maybe you got a lot of brains, but you're going to go over there right now, okay? So we have that splitting idea there. Remorse. You've got to really feel what, what does that mean to really feel what you've done? It's not only admitting the fault, it's also admitting the, back to your idea, the pain that you've caused another. Painful? Yeah, if you really examine it, if you really feel it. Okay. Why is it so hard to admit one is wrong? <laughs> what else is it? It's the supreme act of love. Because none of us have an easy time showing that. It is saying, you are right. I am wrong. Your good is more important than my good. Okay? Apparently, the pain of it can destroy you. Look, you know, sometimes just on your own, look at Psalm, which one is it? I'm trying to remember in the Western Bible. Psalm 50, I believe, where David cries out, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. And he goes on. It's the psalm that David writes after he's caught sinning with Bathsheba. After he kills Bathsheba's husband. And Nathan the prophet's like, buddy. And he goes on to this long, long thing about, you know, created in sin, et cetera, et cetera. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit. That is, break me down and rebuild me. Look at that psalm in connection with what Rowling writes here. I think she had it in the back of her mind. Okay? Hermione, I can't see Voldemort attempting it somehow. Can you? Why can't you? What would it mean Voldemort would have to do? I, who have gone beyond the bounds anybody else has gone, am wrong. Okay. Kind of interesting, though. Eh, shall I go there? No, I'm not going to go there yet. So, Ron, no, nor can I. Does it say how to destroy Horcruxes? Notice, Ron kind of gets to the more important question. We've got the Horcruxes, or we're going to, we think. We need to figure out how to kill those. That is, we don't need to worry about how to save little Tommy Riddle. We need to figure out how to kill the bastard. Okay? So, they think uh, Basilisk Fang, right? Killed the diary. Uh, Hermione, it doesn't have to be. But it has to be something destructive so that the Horcrutch can't repair itself. Basilisk venom only has one antidote. Here, yeah. Phoenix tears. Okay, so what else? Um, Ron, but if we wreck the thing it lives in, why can't the bit of soul in it just go and live in something else? Let's say there's a hork. Well, I would kind of start, I'm starting to tend to believe there are all in these things. 
<clears throat> Let's say there's a horcrux in there. Ron says, so if I destroy this, why can't it fly from here into that book? Hermione, because a horcrux is the complete opposite of a human being. And notice Ron and Harry look thoroughly confused. Like, what the hell are you talking about? What do you mean it's the complete opposite? So Hermione says, if I were to pick up a sword right now, Ron, and ran you through with it, I wouldn't damage your soul at all, Ron. That'd be a real comfort to me, I'm sure. Why? I mean, Ron means that sarcastically, right? Because he's thinking, you run me through with a sword, I'm going to what? I'm going to die. Harry laughs. Hermione, it should, actually. My point is that, and notice, sword, point, yeah, she is punning there. My point is that whatever happens to your body, your soul will survive untouched. Notice what Hermione is assuming. Notice what the whole discussion of Horcruxes assumes. There is such a thing as a soul. If you read Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy, Pullman essentially argues, right? When you get to the third book, there is no such thing as a soul. When you die, the you that you think of as you just dissipates. Like, you know, if you look outside right now, it's not as foggy as it was a little bit earlier. Your body dies, and the consciousness becomes unconsciousness, and it just flits away to nothing. Does Voldemort think that? No. Because if Voldemort thought that, his name wouldn't be Voldemort. He wouldn't flee from death. Why do people fear death? Because it's the great unknown. Because they assume or maybe irrationally, they believe there is something after death. As Hamlet puts it, the great, the undiscovered country from whose born no one returns. Okay? I've talked before about, you know, Plato and so, uh, Socrates and such. So, Hermione, your soul will survive untouched, but it's the other way around with a horcrux. The fragment of soul inside it Depends. Depends. We've talked about that word before. What does it literally mean? It hangs from the thing that contains it. Destroy the thing and the thing depending, the fragment of soul, is also destroyed. It's enchanted body for survival. It can't exist without it. You, Harry, Ron, can... Seriously. You, Harry, Ron, can exist without it. Do we have any proof in the novels? Or any suggestion of proof? Book five... Department of Mysteries. The room with the arch. What does Luna say? Come on, Harry. You heard them. Just beyond the veil. And Harry's like, what? It's not like I'm not going to see my mother again. It isn't. And that's when she brings that up. Her uh, Luna thinks... Her mother's still alive. She's just not alive where she can see her. I think, could be wrong, totally admit that. I think when Harry looks in the mirror, he's seeing his parents' souls. They're communicating how. Harry looks. What does he first see? He sees the woman and the man. She's doing what? She's crying. He turns around. He looks again. 
She's crying. The man puts his arm around her. He does this. The cry turns to crying and smiling at the same time. Because what is in the mirror realizes what is outside the mirror sees what is in the mirror. And the fact that he actually wave. That's not just Harry's deepest, darkest, you know, desire of the heart. What about the wand? What pops out of Voldemort's wand? Is Wormtail's hand part of his soul? No, it's part of the physical body. But souls don't exist. Let me put, let me put it this way. Souls are made for bodies. Bodies are made for souls. That's why in the Christian tradition, Rowling said in that early interview, about 2001, 2002, she was a Christian. She couldn't answer how her Christianity informed her books because it would give away the end. In the Christian tradition, that's why the whole doctrine of the resurrection is all important. Souls are meant to be reunited with bodies. This is another reason why it's important that they find Moody's body. The body is sacred. It's significant. And it's not an accident that when Harry, when they get Moody's eye, what do they do with it? What does Harry do with it? He finds a tree. He digs a hole. He puts Moody's eye in the ground, in the hole, and then what does he do? All hail, Mad Eye Moody, and they walk away. Nope. He uses his wand and burns a cross on the tree. To me, it is the most enigmatic thing in the entire series. Why? Why doesn't he put I can't draw. a star of David? How do we know Mad Eye isn't Jewish? Why doesn't he put, you know, the Red Crescent? How do we know he's not Muslim? Why doesn't he put, think of any other religious symbol. Why a cross? Is it because Harry's secretly a Christian? Nope. Harry seemingly knows absolutely nothing. All seven books. About any religious tradition. About any faith tradition. I mean, it's why I ask Nick, what happens when you die? It's like he's never heard of anything after death. It's like he's never contemplated, never once thought for a moment about death, even after he's heard about how his parents died and everything. Okay? So they keep talking. Hermione says, while the magical container is still intact, think diary, the bit of soul inside it can flit in and out of someone if they get too close to the object. Where did we already see that happen? With the diary. Who got too close to the diary? Ginny did. And in fact, when Harry defeats Tom Riddle, what is happening to that shimmering image? Before Harry stabs the diary, what's happening to that 16-year-old portion, or that portion of 16-year-old Tom Riddle's soul? It's becoming more and more and more real. Because notice, what can that, for lack of a better term, what can that apparition do? It can hold a wand. It's not just spirit, because how can spirit, which is air, hold it? I don't mean holding it for too long. It's nothing to do with touching it. I mean close emotionally. And she talked about Jenny. Okay, Harry, 
I wonder how Dumbledore destroyed the ring. Why didn't I ask him? Well, there's a lot of things Harry could have asked him, you know, but he never did. All right, so we go on. The will of Albus Dumbledore. A uh, couple pages in, I don't know, 113 or so. Mrs. Weasley gives Harry a birthday present. And we're told, it's traditional to give a wizard a watch when he comes of age. I'm afraid that one isn't new like Ron's. It was actually my brother Fabian's. And he wasn't terribly careful with his possession. possessions. It's a bit dented on the back. But, and Harry hugs her. Okay, she said my brother wasn't very careful with his possession. Is there possibly another reason why the watch is dented on the back? Anybody remember what Mad Eye told us about Fabian in Book Five? It took several Death Eaters to take him. See, it might have gotten damaged in his final battle. Because when you get killed with a Vada Kedavra, what happens to you? You fall. You don't necessarily, you know, always fall on your back. What if you get hit from the behind, from your back? You fall forward. If he's carrying his pocket watch, like most people would do, and the implication is, you know, wizards are kind of fastidious about their dress. He probably has underneath his robe a waistcoat. We would call it a vest here. Then he carries the watch in one pocket, and it's got a little silver or, or chain and a fob over here that keeps it. So he pulls it out to look at it, puts it in. If he falls on it forward, it could get dented like that. I, I'm sheer speculation on my part, right? But it was her brother's, and that was Fabian Pruitt's, and he was a previous member of the Order of the Phoenix. Kind of interesting. Why weren't Arthur and Molly? We don't know. We're never told. Okay? So, Scrimger comes in. And he comes to read to them Dumbledore's will. Pages 122 or so. Okay? Dumbledore leaves each of them something. What does he leave Ron? The Deluminator. What's it also called? The put outer. It puts out lights, deluminates, okay, rather than illuminates. And we're told why. To Ronald Billius we <coughs> Weasley, I leave my deluminator in the hope that he will remember me when he uses it. Okay? And Scrimger pulls it out, and he says, well, yeah, it's a valuable object. Only one like it in the world. Okay? Notice Ron's middle name, by the way, Bilious. Related to the word bile. Which, in the Middle Ages, you have black bile and red bile, I believe. These are two of the, what are called, humors which are kind of like these, these spirit essences, not spirits, not like demons, but these, these tendencies in every person's nature. Some people have more of one than another, etc. Bile is what leads to irrational anger. Ron is also what? A redhead. What are redheads known for? Short fuse, okay? What are we going to see? Ron gets jealous. And he's out. Okay? So, what does Hermione get? I leave my copy of the Tales of Beetle the Bard in the hope that she will find it entertaining and instructive. Horace, ancient Roman poet, I used to know the Latin for this. Yeah, total blank. Said that the purpose of literature 
was to teach and delight. Instructive and entertaining. Okay? What kind of tales are the tales of Beetle the Bard? Children's lit. Go talk to Dr. Hickson or Dr. Marchant or Dr. Donovan, you know. Kitty lit. How much use does Hermione have for kitty lit? None. Absolutely none. Okay. Why do you think he left you that book? I don't know. He knows I like books. To Harry James Potter, I leave the snitch. He caught in his first Quidditch match at Hogwarts. As a reminder of the rewards of perseverance and skill. How much skill did it take Harry to capture that snitch? Yeah, he nearly swallowed it. Okay. But he was perseverant. He did keep going. Why did Dumbledore leave you there? Beats me. Symbolic? I, okay. Your birthday cake's in the, snake, in the shape of a snitch. Why could that be? Hermione. Oh, I don't know. Reference it. Perhaps Harry's a great seeker. First book. Why is Harry made a seeker? Yeah, I know. He catches Neville's remember and all that. That's a plot device. <laughs> Harry's got to be a seeker. Why? It wouldn't do any good for him to be a beater in terms of the overall arc of the stories. Because all throughout the stories, he's seeking. What's he seeking? Who am I? Because who am I implies what? What is my purpose? Two great philosophical questions that everybody has to answer at some point in their lives. Who am I? Which doesn't just mean what's on my driver's license, what's on my birth certificate, and why am I here? What is my purpose? Some people go all their lives and never find out the answers. They try one thing, one thing after another. You know, they try to find the answer to this in, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, etc. So, what else? Dumbledore leaves Harry the sword of Godric Gryffindor. Scrimger said, ah, you don't get to keep that. Why? It wasn't Dumbledore's to give. Why not? Because Dumbledore's last name is a Gryffindor. In other words, if Dumbledore were the last remaining descendant of Godric Gryffindor, okay, then maybe we could accept it's his to give. Notice, by the way, it's the sword of Godric Gryffindor, which is what, therefore? A relic of Godric Gryffindor. Okay, Dumbledore said, there's only one thing of Gryffindor's that survives. It's implied the sword. There is still also the hat. Right? Scrimger, according to reliable historical sources, the sword may present itself to any worthy Gryffindor. What does that mean? Any worthy Gryffindor. Possibly. What did Dumbledore say when Harry gave him the sword at the end of Chamber of Secrets. He says, only a, he doesn't say worthy, only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that sword out of that hat. And Harry thinks, yes, I really did belong in Gryffindor. That's why the hat put me there. Yes and no. A true Gryffindor. Harry is related to Godric Gryffindor, just as Tom Riddle is related to Salazar Slytherin. Right? Should I go there or not? Yeah, I'm going to suggest something. And what does the sorting hat say happened? 
to Hogwarts after several years. Fighting and such became so bad that Slytherin left and left Hogwarts what? All downhearted. You know, the four chambers, one left, so it's not working right. In the hat suggests what is needed for it to be repaired. Slither needs to come back. Jump to the end of the novel. I won't say anything else. All right? So, did he wish to give you that because he believed you were the one destined to defeat Voldemort? Harry, I don't know. People are dying. I was nearly one of them. Voldemort chased me across three counties. He killed Mount I. Moody, but there's been no word about any of that from the newspapers. That is, there's been nothing in the news. Why is that? You go too far. You know, Scrimger stands up, limps towards Harry, lights his wand, burns Harry's chest, hole through the shirt. Ron, boy, raises his own wand. It's time you learn some respect. Harry, it's time you earned it. Okay? And then Harry says, I don't like your methods. What does he mean, your? The ministries. He's merely a symbol of the entire ministry. And Harry does this. And shows him the scar. Okay? So, Harry, Ron, and Hermione go to talk about what they've been left. And Harry looks at the snitch, and it reads, I open at the close. What does that mean? They don't know. Next chapter, the wedding. We meet a couple pages in, about three, so about one page 140. There's a guy wearing a robe eye-watering shade of egg yolk yellow, and there's an odd symbol on it, like a triangular eye. Xenophilius Lovegood. Yes, I had to make sure I had the right spell. Luna's dead. Okay? Names are important. Xenophilius. Think of another word. It's used an awful lot today. That starts with Xeno. But doesn't end with Philius. Xenophobic. Means what? Afraid of foreigners. Afraid of aliens. Because the phobic means afraid or fear of. Okay? So, xeno, foreign, alien, strange. It doesn't mean the errs. Strangers, foreigners, alien you know. So, xeno, foreign, strange, alien, what it really means, you go back to the Greek, other. Other. Phileus. If it were spelled this way, like Flitwick's name, Phileus Flitwick, this is Latin. It means Son of. But this is Greek. And it means love of. Love of the other. Love of the foreign. Love of the strange. Love of the alien. Does Xenophilius love good? Love strange, weird things. Yes, he does. And he passed that on to his daughter. What else does it mean, though? Love of the other. That is love. Acceptance of. The other. What term does not describe Xenophilius Lovegood? How is Xenophilius Lovegood different than Dolores Jane Umbridge? 
What does she think about the other? Or how is Xenophilius Lovegood different than um, Petunia and Vernon Dursley? They were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They didn't put up with strange and mysterious strange and mysterious things. Xenophilius, hey man, all the merrier. He has what? He has an open mind. In fact, he's going to have a conversation with Hermione, and he's going to tell her her mind is closed. Okay, and it's true. So he extends a hand to Harry. Harry says, "I'm Barty," because he's disguised. Okay, and. We meet Auntie Muriel. Who is Auntie Muriel, the Wizarding World's equal or opposite of? Not opposite. She's the same, but in the Wizarding World. Aunt Marge. Drunk old hag. <laughs> That's what she is. Okay? So, we hear a few pages on. So this is. 22 pages. Somewhere around 143, 144. We see Fleur come up and Bill come up, you know, and Bill's all scarred. And, you know, Fleur said in the previous book, I am pretty enough for the both of us, you know, stuff. So they get married. And we hear this person officiating say, We are gathered here today to celebrate. The union of two faithful souls. Union. Souls. Okay. And Auntie Muri is, you know, blathering on, etc. Do you, William Arthur, take Fleur Isabel? Mrs. Weasley and Madame Delacour are both, you know, sobbing quietly. Do you, William Arthur, take Fleur Isabel? Dot, dot, dot. And the next thing we hear of the ceremony, then I declare you bonded for life. How's that? For an unbreakable vow. Because bonded for life implies what? What if you try to break the bond? Then you die. And yet, what do we see in the novels? Think of the Riddle family, not Tom's parents. Tom the Elder, <laughs> Tom the Younger's parents. That wasn't a wizard marriage, though, was it? That was a muggle marriage. We all know muggle marriages, you know. Okay, how about Hagrid's family? His father was a wizard and his mother was a giant. What happened to their marriage? So Tom Riddle Jr.'s parents split. Hagrid's parents split. Snape's? Do we know? Are we told that Snape's father left? We know his mother was a witch. His father was a muggle. We're going to see, if we haven't already, broken, strewn across the landscape, wizarding family. And you can always say that the books are about functional versus dysfunctional families. Because all the major characters, they kind of come from dysfunctional families. For example, we're going to hear about Dumbledore's family. We hear nothing about his father. We hear about, we hear about his mother and his sister. Nothing about his father. What about Sirius? He ran away from his family. He abandoned his family. He was raised from the age of 16 on by whom? James Potter's, James Potter's parents. Okay. Kind of kind of interesting what she's doing there. So notice you don't enter into a Magical marriage lightly. 
It's not some, yeah, you know, we'll be happy for a few years and then I'll go find a younger one, you know. No trophy wives in the in the wizarding world, apparently. Okay. So Harry speaks to Crumb. And I, I don't have time for all this because we ought to be really moving a lot faster. Harry speaks to Crumb. Crumb is what? Not as who is what? How does he feel about being there? Or how does he feel about someone he sees there? Louder? He's angry because Xenophilius is wearing this, which he calls, Crumb calls what? Grindelwald's mark. I spell Grindelwald is it E L or L E? It's E L. I'm thinking Beowulf. It's Grindelwald's mark. And he says, Crumb's jaws, jaw muscles worked as if he were chewing. Then he said, Grindelwald killed many people. My grandfather, for instance. Of course, he was never powerful in his country. That's it. He goes on and on. He speaks like a Russian because he's from Bulgaria. So he points at Xenophilius. He says, this mark used to be where? All over at Durmstrang. People who thought they were Grindelwald's followers and such. Okay. So they keep talking. Harry runs into Elphias Doge a few pages later. And Harry asks him, what Rita Skeeter said about Dumbledore. She hinted he was involved in the dark arts when he was young. Don't, verb, believe a word of it. Not a word, Harry. Let nothing tarnish your memories. Tarnish means what? To dull, to darken. Let your memories of Dumbledore be what? Ooh, the phoenix rising from the tomb. Harry looked into Doja's earnest, pained face and felt not reassured, but frustrated. This is 157, 156, around 153. Look at the question. This is what is going to plague Harry from here to almost the end of the book. Did Doge, Doge, however you pronounce his name, really think it was that easy? that Harry could simply choose not to believe. Not to believe what? Notice, Harry's thinking is not. Did Doge really think it was that easy? That Harry could simply choose to believe. It's to choose not to believe. Didn't Doge understand Harry's need to be sure to know everything? What question did Harry raise to Lupin and Arthur Weasley back in the chapter, A Very Frosty Christmas? How do we know? How do we know Dumbledore is right? How do we know that Snape is good? Because what happens, you know, Less than six months later, Snape kills Dumbledore. We don't know. Everything Harry is led to believe, poof. Okay. Perhaps Doge suspected Harry's feelings. Why is that possible? What magical ability do we know there exists that one could use to maybe figure out what somebody's thinking. I mean, Dumbledore told Harry when they're talking about Morphin, he says, you know, it took quite skilled legilimency to extract this memory. That's Dumbledore telling us, you know, I'm not so shabby when it comes to legilimency. And that should make Harry think about every other conversation he's had with Dumbledore when he kind of has Dumbledore looking at him, and we're told in that book, book six, and he almost feels like Dumbledore is x-raying him. That's 
because Dumbledore is, you know, doing what he shouldn't be doing, right? And then Auntie Muriel, here's the name Serena Skeeter, and she enters the conversation. But notice, when she really gets going is when? After she drains her goblet and clicks her bony fingers at a passing water waiter for a replacement, she took another large gulp of champagne. After she's well lubricated, okay, she gets going. You would say that, Elphias. I noticed how you skated over the sticky patches in that obituary of yours, showing, implying, Auntie Muriel knows some things that Doge doesn't know, or that Doge knows and wants to leave out. Muriel, a chill that had nothing to do with the iced champagne was stealing through Harry's chest. Why? What is that chill? What usually happens, usually, let's say prior to the middle of book six, what usually happens, and except for book five, because he's got, you know, Voldemort in his head and all that kind of stuff. What usually happens when Harry thinks of Dumbledore? He feels good. He feels buoyed up. He feels enlivened. He feels the warm fuzzies inside. Okay? He feels, we're told more than once, our door. There is a flame welling up. It's like Dumbledore is, is a calming, warming person. Now, this chill steals through Harry's chest. Why? Because Muriel is killing it, okay? So we overhear all the talk about Dumbledore's sister being a squib and how Ariana, you know, uh, how his mother kept her hidden, kept her locked up and stuff. And we're told, page 152, Doge, how do you, he's going to say, how do you know? Okay. And she goes, my mother was friendly with old Matilda Bagshot. You know. Muriel swigged yet more champagne. The recitation of these old scandals seemed to elate her as much as they horrified Doge. Harry did not know what to think. What to believe. He wanted the truth. He's had Elphias Doge's version of the truth. He's had Rita Skeeter's version of the truth. Now he's heard Auntie Muriel's version of the truth. Notice, version, version, version. Each one of them is what? It's a perspective. Okay. Harry wants what? He wants the capital T truth. He wants the pure, unvarnished, unadulterated, just give it to me. Harry could hardly believe that Dumbledore would not have intervened if such cruelty was happening inside his own house. And yet there's something odd about the story. Something doesn't fit, right? And she goes on and talks about Matilda Bagshot. Harry's like, wait, I know that name. History of magic. Yep. Most gifted magical historian. Still alive and where? Living in Godric's Hollow. Harry. What? The Dumbledores lived in Godric's Hollow? Why is that important? Because that's where his parents lived. That's where he lived. Dumbledore never mentioned there was a connection. Had Dumbledore visited their graves, perhaps walked past Lily and James's to do so, and he never once told Harry, never bothered to say? What is Harry doing here? 
questioning, he's making assumptions, right? Making assumptions. Assumptions are what? They're ideas. Are they proven? Are they facts? No, they're not. And the wedding party gets crashed. The ministry has fallen. Scrimgeour's dead, etc. Chapter 9. Let's see, how far was I going to? Trying to go up to that chapter. What time is it? 249, 15 minutes. We can get close. So, Hermione takes him to Tottenham Court, Tottenham Court Road. And she mentions Voldemort's name. Around 161, 2, 3, around 164. And they're in the, the pub, and Dolohoff and uh, the other ones show up. Harry attacks them. Okay. We're going to skip a bit more again. They make the way to number 12, Grimmel Place, nearly get caught. And while there, 174 probably, Hermione again mentions Voldemort's name. It's like, you know, now that she's comfortable saying it, it's like Voldemort this, Voldemort that. She's just, you know, showing off. Okay. Um, and Harry has, Harry is overwhelmed by his scar. He runs into the bathroom and he sees What's happening with Voldemort? Page 175. More, Raoul, or shall we end it and feed you to Nagin? Lord Voldemort is not sure that he will forgive this time. You called me back for this to tell me that Harry Potter has escaped again? Draco, give Raoul another taste of our displeasure. Our does not mean mine and yours, Draco. Why does he use our? I'm running out of board. <laughs> it's the royal we, exactly right. Talk about putting on airs. He really does think he's a lord. No. Do it or feel my wrath yourself. Why does he have to say do it? Because Draco doesn't. <laughs> Draco doesn't go, yes, sir, and immediately zap Ralph. Harry felt sickened by what he had seen, by the use to which Draco was now being put by Voldemort. Draco is merely what? A puppet? Keep going. He's a weapon. That's all he is. He's a tool. Draco seemingly has no free will, right? And it's not because he's imperious. Chapter 10, Creature's Tale. Third paragraph. <clears throat> the grief that had possessed him since Dumbledore's death felt different now. Why? That the grief he felt was for what? Um, initially, at least. Dumbledore's dead. He can never go up and talk to him, right? He, he can never, you know, lemon drop it. Uh, I, I, can we look in your pensive and the accusations he had heard <coughs> from Muriel at the wedding seemed to have nested in his brain like diseased things, infecting his memories of the wizard he had idolized. Okay, first of all, these things nest in his brain and they infect his memories. What else happens? If somebody drop, dumps a bucket of water on your head, is it only your head that's affected? No. It goes down through the rest of your body. Okay? Infecting his memories of the wizard he had idolized. What's the problem with the sentence? Or where does the problem lie in the sentence? He did what? He idolized Dumbledore. What does that mean? What do you do when you idolize something? You look up to it. It's more than that, though, isn't it? 
You want to be like it? You turn it into this. An idol. That's something to be worshipped. What do you tend to do? Let's just assume for, for a moment. To people that one idolizes. You overlook their faults. And the overlooking is sometimes intentional. Well, he's going to be so much better than X, Y, or Z. And you forget. Yeah, but look at his faults. You know, this happens all the time with presidential candidates. We see a person. We maybe know the history of a person. And we go, yeah, but what this person says he or she is going to do, it's worth it. Okay. What's the problem with that? Eventually, those faults, they make themselves known. Those problems get magnified. In other words, every idol is ultimately what? It's a creature of our own making. We emphasize what we like about that. It, it, same thing applies, for example, in marriage. One can idolize one's spouse. But what do you do when you do that? You remove the humanity. You remove the realness of that person. Okay? And what will happen to every idol? Well, it gets knocked off its pedestal. It falls in, like Humpty Dumpty, it's shattered. Could Dumbledore have let such things happen? Had he been like Dudley? Harry thought of Godric's Hollow, a grave Dumbledore never mentioned. Why hadn't Dumbledore told him? Why hadn't he explained? Had Dumbledore actually cared about Harry at all? Or, big question, answered later, had Harry been nothing more than a tool be, to be polished and honed, but not trusted, never confided in? Short answer is yes. Harry's not going to realize how much of a tool until much, much, much later on. Okay? So, They go around, they look in the rooms and stuff. Um, he sees, you know, Sirius's bedroom. He sees his brother's bedroom. And Harry finds a note in Sirius's room. Or part of a letter, I should say. I'm going to skip the first part. Second paragraph, right in the middle. James is getting a bit frustrated. Shut up here. He tries not to show up, but I can tell. Also, Dumbledore still got his invisibility cloak, so no chance of little excursions. If you could visit, it would cheer him up so much. Wormy was here last weekend. Thought he seemed down. But that was probably his, the news about the McKinnons. I cried all evening when I heard. Matilda drops in most days. She's a fascinating old thing. Most amazing stories about Dumbledore. You know, Harry's Dumbledore in ten eyes. Beep, 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 beep. I'm not sure he'd be pleased if he knew. I don't know how much to believe, actually, because it seems incredible that Dumbledore no more of the letter. Okay? When is this? Thank you for Harry's birthday present. This is after Harry's first birthday. And obviously before, <laughs> October 31st, 1981. Okay, Harry's born July 31st, 1980. His parents die October 31st, 1981. It's sometime within that August, September, October, during that three months. All right. Notice, Wormy was here last weekend. Seemed down.
Here he's trying to figure out what this letter means, how it can be important. The only thing he sees important in it is the possible information it sheds on Dumbledore, right or wrong, okay? Skip a couple pages. This is going to be, I would have sworn I had these all marked, but I don't. This is going to be around 183, 184. Here he talks to Hermione about Batilda Bagshot and such, about the letter, about Godric's Hollow. She's like, I know you want to go to Godric's Hollow, but we can't. It'll be watched. Harry, I'd just like to know whether or not it's true. That is, he's told them about what he heard from Auntie Muriel. They've read Rita Skeeter's rag. Hermione, Harry, do you really think you'll get the truth from a malicious old woman like Muriel or from Rita Skeeter? How can you get the truth from Rita Skeeter? What do you have to do? You got to blackmail her. You got to tell her, I'm going to let the whole world know you're an unregistered animagus. That's the only way, okay? How can you believe them? You knew, notice what she's juxtaposing belief, knowledge. You knew Dumbledore. Thought I did. Kind of sounds like Dudley. But you know how much truth there was in everything. She wrote about you. Rita wrote about you. Doge is right. How can you let these people tarnish your memories of Dumbledore? Harry looks away. He can't even bear to look at Hermione. Try not to betray the resentment he felt. What resentment? Is it resentment at Hermione or resentment at not knowing what to believe? There it was again. Choo second time. <laughs> Choose what to believe. He doesn't want to choose what to believe. Why? He wants the truth, right? That's not a matter of belief. It's simple fact. You can't say, well, I don't believe it. Because if you're going to say you don't believe it, then you're what you're saying, really, is reality means nothing. All right? Harry wants this about Dumbledore. He doesn't want to choose what to believe. Why? What if you're wrong? What if you don't have enough information? Why was everybody so determined he should not get it? And they go by the other bedroom. Do not enter without the express permission of Regulus Arcturus Black. R A B. The light goes off. The locket. So they go in and they search. Notice, they try a magical search first. Uh, Oxio, no. Ron, how are we supposed to find it? If we can't find it by magic, Hermione, we search manually. In other words, Ron, get down on your hands and knees. <laughs> work. How much work has Ron, I keep thinking that's water, how much work has Ron ever really had to do? None. Everything at home is done magically. Okay. Hermione has, because she grew up in a non-magical world. Harry has, because we've seen it. Ron wants magical solutions to all their problems. So, they talk to Creature. Creature tells them what he was forced to do about the island, the cave, the basin and everything. And Harry says, page 193, 194 probably, you know, 
when creature says, Master Rangelis told me to come back when I was done with the Dark Lord. Harry, I know, but Ron, he operated. You can't. You can't operate in and out of there, otherwise double door. Run. Elf magic isn't like wizard's magic. I mean, they can do things, they can operate in and out of Hogwarts, but we can't. Harry's trying to wrap his mind around that, and Hermione says, of course Voldemort would have considered the ways of house elves far beneath his notice, just like all the purebloods who treat them like animals. It would never have occurred to him that they might have magic that he didn't. Creature, the house elf's highest law is his master's bidding. Voldemort wasn't his master. Creature was told to come home, so I came home. Okay. They keep talking. Harry kind of blows up at Creature. And we're out of time. Um, shoot. About, we'll pick up. Tuesday, about three pages before, two pages before the end of that chapter. And we need to get, I'd hoped to get us through chapter 17. Next time, we need to try to get through chapter 26. Okay? A lot to try to cover. Have a good weekend. Stay warm.